Hello, hello, hello. If you don't know by us by now, I'm Beverly Danqua. And I... And this is Devon. <laughs> I can introduce myself. And I am Devon. Devon Arnold. Anyway, I'm just playing Go Ahead. See what I have to deal with? She plays too much. I can't take her. Anyway. I'm sorry. I had to get all of my no. fun out now because the topic we're addressing on this show is heavy and there's a lot to cover. So we don't have time for why, though. I know, I know. Some of our viewers are 21... Plus, viewers, you know, might need another kind of nightcap for this show. But I'm so. Psh, no. So let's <laughs> get our seats because we need to get things started. Okay. Okay. If you have had a few nightcaps with us, then you know that most of our topics thus far have been surrounding all the college roles. Yes, yeah, so we did a show about finding free money and declaring a major, finding the right college fit. And how to get acclimated to college if you're a freshman like myself. However, many of our teens are facing much greater problems. In the wake of unconstitutional practices such as stop and frisk and police using excessive force, the faces of our youth are at risk of being slammed against the concrete or the hood of a car at any given day. Take a look. Where, where a police officer has been caught on camera slamming a teenage girl to the ground and dragging the student out of the classroom. The videos, which went viral on Monday, appear to show Deputy Sheriff Ben Fields approaching the student who was seated at her desk, then wrapping his arm around her and flipping her and her desk to the ground. He then appears to drag her out of the classroom. The student was arrested. Another student who filmed the assault was also arrested and held on $1,000 bail. <laughs> from um, just in their community, they invited them to the pool party. They were all invited guests, everyone that was there. And other people who lived in the neighborhood, they were complaining, saying, oh, we don't want these black people in our neighborhood, go back to your Section 8 housing. And the police were called, and in the video, as you can see, as soon as the police were called, everything everything was completely out of control. The 14-year-old girl, she viciously slammed to the floor. Her head is put, her face is in the grass, and her, she's being, um, the officer is kneeling into her back. She's, in the video, you can hear her saying, get off me, she's obviously in distress. We found all those clips on YouTube, and that wasn't even all that we found. That was really difficult for me to watch. Well, this is a tough topic. Mm -hmm. But we always say Nightcap is a show that seeks to equip teens and young adults with the information and advice needed to navigate through life. And with a reported 500,000 youths in the U.S. criminal justice, and on any given day, more than 26,000 youths are detained, detained, it is our responsibility to unpack this issue. And here to help us do just that is Janet Garcia. Janet is currently a Ph.D. candidate at Rutgers School of Criminal Justice. Her research is primarily focused on social justice, for, justice issues for racial eth ethnic minorities, particularly the impact of incarcerations on families. She is currently writing her dissertation, which investigates how formerly incarcerated women navigate motherhood post-incarceration. Come on out, Janet. Thank you. Hello. Hello and welcome. Hey. Hi, how are you? We're good. How are you? I'm good. Great. 
Since we have a lot to cover for this show, we're going to jump right in. Okay. Um, when researching for this show, um, my starting point was the question, who is a juvenile in the state of New York? And I was stunned to find out that New York is the only state, aside from North Carolina, that tries 16 and 17 year olds as, as adults, regardless of the crime. Meanwhile, the legal limit to purchase cigarettes was just raised to 21, and that's like ridiculous. What are your thoughts on this? So I think it's important that you brought up this clash in how juveniles are viewed, especially in the criminal justice system. So in essence, New York City juveniles are not viewed old enough or responsible enough to purchase their own cigarettes. And they're viewed as being protected from the health risks of smoking cigarettes. Mm -hmm. Yet on the same note, in New York State, juveniles who are 16 and 17 are viewed as adults and can be held responsible for their actions as adults in the court of law. So there's a big conflict here, right? In some degrees, we're protecting juveniles. In other degrees, we're very punitive towards juveniles, especially in New York and in North Carolina. So I think it's problematic when we try juveniles as adults. Even younger, when we're waving juveniles into the adult criminal justice system. This can be 15, 14, 13. So instead of actually trying juveniles in the adult criminal justice system, more effort should be made to actually look at the research and what we're seeing about juveniles. Juveniles are very different from adults. Um, how young can one be arrested? Actually, um, it depends on the police officer, to be honest with you. In terms of juveniles going into the New York State um, juvenile justice system, seven. And that's going into the juvenile criminal justice system. Um, in terms of arrest, it can actually depend on the police officer. So there's a lot of discretion at the hands of the police officer when you're approached with a situation and it's someone who's underage, whether they decide to let them off for a warning or actually continue to arrest that person on hand. Yeah, and I also read that um, if they can even decide to take you to a detention center, and it really all depends on how the police officer is feeling at that time. So you just have to be lucky that day, I guess. Um, before we get into the juvenile justice system and its procedures, what are some do's and don'ts for young people if they're stopped by the police or thought to have committed a crime that might help prevent them from coming in contact with the system? I think that's a very important question, and oftentimes juveniles are unsure what to do and often are concerned with what they do see on media and the assaults faced by police officers. Um, it's important to understand that you do have some rights. You are not forced to actually abide by certain uh, questions that they're being asked at a certain point in time, specifically if you're driving, usually in another state other than New York. Um, but also to make sure you know why you're being stopped. You can ask questions at that point in time. Um, often you have juveniles who are stopped and frisked on the street and there are some rights to know why you're being stopped by a police officer. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes they're exposed to a lot of violence in those incidents and if there are not witnesses there it becomes a he say she say incident. There is a lot of controversy surrounding the juvenile system which is different from the adult criminal justice system. Um, while some protest the leniency of the system, others protest the lack of procedural protections given to the minor. Okay. From what I read, um, it seems like juveniles have fewer rights than adult offenders. For instance, I read that unlike with adult police, uh, they don't have, the police don't have to be uh, personally there when the incident happens or to witness the felony or misdemeanor um, being committed to take the juvenile into custody. What are some key factors that the youth should know about their rights and the system? So their rights in their system when they're being exposed to police yeah, in yeah, the street? Yeah. Um, um, so juveniles can have a right to have a parent there when they're being asked questions. Um, that's something that juveniles definitely should be aware of. There are many incidents where juveniles are continuously asked a series of questions and are kind of pushed to answer these questions without an adult there present with them. And this, in many incidences, have been used to kind of hurt them when they actually do go to trial. And this is something similar that happened with the Central Park Five. They were all juveniles in that incident. They were all questioned without their parents there. And those were actually used in the trial. So it's very helpful to say, well, can I have a parent here? Or I refuse to answer any questions until I have someone who's here on my behalf. So that's definitely something important to ask at that point. 
and say that you know you have that right because it can definitely help you later on if it does go to trial. Um, and also to refrain from self-incrimination. So it's okay for you to keep quiet and it's okay for you to do that. And sometimes it's actually best for you to um, remain quiet even though you're, you view you yourself as protecting your, your um, alibi or you know that you have someone there with you. Oftentimes that can still be used to work against you. So sometimes it is best to remain quiet until you have that adult on your behalf in those situations. So should you take the first steps in getting a lawyer, or um, would, some, would, your, would your parent do that for you? And can you remain quiet until you have your lawyer present? Yes, you can remain quiet until you have a lawyer present on your behalf. Um, you can ask for your lawyer yourself, in my opinion, or you can ask for your parent to arrive there to actually request for the lawyer to okay. come on your behalf. Okay, um, I read that once a youth gets in the juvenile the justice system, it's hard to get them out. Do you agree? I think that once juveniles are involved in the system, there's definitely a more detrimental impact on juveniles. Um, usually when juveniles are involved in wrongdoing, um, it's because they're responding to their social environment, whether it's the home, whether it's their school environment, their peers, or their neighborhood. They're usually responding to something in their environment, if they have done something. Now placing juveniles in a detention center can have a more detrimental impact because of the environment of that facility. So you're taken away from school. Once you're released, you may have problems managing those school expectations once you return. You're away from your positive social support network. So you're exposed to others who you do not know, and you're in a place where you're not comfortable, you're not familiar, right? You may be exposed to violence, you may be exposed to maltreatment. So these are all influences and factors that can shape or break you while you're there and it can have a long-term impact on you even once you're well into adulthood. So do you think um, things like Beyond Scared Straight works? No, I don't. And there are a lot of shows <laughs> that have this focus, Beyond Scared Straight, and very punitive, and they may show a short-term impact, maybe right when they're released, they want to change, mm -hmm. but long-term, it doesn't have an impact. So I believe Maury did that at one time. There are some shows that focus on placing juveniles in somewhat of a boot camp setting, but it can have a detrimental effect or can have a short-term effect if it does. So immediately, right when they're released, they may want to change, but if nothing else changes in their community and the social structural barriers they're faced with, then the problems will still continue. All right, the structure and process of the juvenile system is too complicated to go through everything, but mm -hmm. let's get to the basics. Um, okay. A juvenile gets arrested, what happens then? Um, a juvenile gets arrested, it can depend also based on the police officer, but um, sometimes they can be asked what they're doing in a specific setting, uh, where they're going, things, things of that nature. Um, there are also some racial ethnic differences in that regard. Some people um, who are, may look like us are more likely to be arrested than others. Um, they're also more likely to be detained compared to others. Um, so it's also looking at how things are dealt with at the beginning stages that may have an impact uh, later on. Um, but a juvenile can be questioned about a specific incident why they were stopped or arrested at that point in time and can be detained moving forward. What should parents do if their child has been detained? Parents should definitely ask why their child was detained. They have a right to know and understand why the child was detained. Um, if they're being arrested for those charges, and if they're not being arrested, they should be allowed to leave. Um, they have a right to understand why they've been stopped, and if they can be there while they're being questioned, or if not, view the questioning at that point in time. If a juvenile is ordered to stay in the detention center, which is like jail for juveniles, one can spend anywhere from a few days to a few months. Um, first, describe the conditions of these detention centers, particularly in New York. Um, so that's a great question. There was actually a federal investigation that was done and it actually reported some of the abuses that were done at Rikers. Um, so once again, in this case, I'm speaking about juveniles who are viewed as adults here in New York State, right? Um, and this report discussed excessive use of violence that juveniles face while they were at Rikers. This report discussed some of the excessive use of force on behalf of the corrections officers. Um, and they also documented the excessive use and dependence on solitary confinement. 
and this is that juveniles are experiencing, or they were experiencing at Rikers. So solitary confinement in and of itself can have detrimental emotional and cognitive effects on juveniles, right? Some can have hallucinations, some can have, some can become suicidal, some can even make suicide attempts. So in fact, juveniles in adult jails can actually, they're actually more likely to commit suicide than those in juvenile facilities. So those in juvenile facilities, they're less likely to be beat by officers, they're less likely to be exposed to sexual assault, uh, they're less likely to commit suicide, but it's still a correctional facility. Mm -hmm. So it's still that setting that you're viewed as an inmate and less as a person. And this can have a detrimental effect on your cognitive, what you're thinking, how you're feeling. And once again, it can have an impact once you're released. So are, um, are um, juveniles able to further their education while they're in the detention center? Um, in detention centers, I'm not sure specifically. There are some settings that focus on juveniles specifically mm -hmm. that have more services compared to one for adults, compared to adult jails. Um, so there, are, there is more push to focus on counseling juveniles while they're detained. There's more focus on providing more services for juveniles while they're detained in comparison to adults because there's, there's understanding that juveniles are different from adults. Um, so it is possible, but in terms of the extent of it, that I wouldn't be able to answer for you. Um, when can you get released from the detention center? Um, it really depends on the, the, the case, case right? at that hand. Mm -hmm. um, detention centers are used to hold juveniles while their case is being sorted out. If a juvenile goes to court and is found delinquent, he or she may be ordered to be confined to a juvenile correctional facility, which is like prison for juveniles. Are the conditions of these places similar to detention centers? Um, I would say yes and probably slightly worse <laughs> compared to detention centers. So once again, it's still a correctional facility, but there is more push to make them more humanly in terms of recognizing some of the differences um, that juveniles face and experience in comparison to adults. And there's also an understanding that juveniles tend to desist from crime over time. So this idea that it's more likely to help juveniles and refrain from wrongdoing in comparison to adults. Mm -hmm. So there more be more, they may be more services to assist them in those settings. Um, but once again, it's still a correctional setting. I would actually advise for alternatives to incarceration mm -hmm. rather than correctional facilities. Um, what impact does confinement or detention centers um, have on the young person's family? Oh, that's a great question. Um, whether it's a young person or an adult who's incarcerated, there's always an impact on the family. Um, whether it's a young person who's incarcerated, it can have an impact on the parents, understanding and knowing that it's their child that's being incarcerated and that may be exposed to these different experiences, whether it's violence, maltreatment, abuse, sexual assault, these are all things that are very likely in these type of facilities. So that can be very detrimental to the parent often who do not feel they have um, any power to address these issues while they're in these settings. Um, also for siblings. So I was part of a study with Vera. We spoke with some of the family members and it did have some impact on other siblings, other family members when they saw their brother or sister that was incarcerated or even detained in certain situations. Um, just knowing that your older brother, the person you look up to, is not there and is really going through a rough time because of something they may have did or a mistake that they made. Um, in the case of parents, oftentimes it's difficult for them as well when they're incarcerated, just knowing that they're away from their children, that they're away from maybe a parent who they were taking care of themselves. Um, and when children try to visit their parents when they're incarcerated, going through visitation can be very difficult. Even that alone is very difficult for some juveniles. Okay, let's move on to re-entry or release from either a detention center or correctional facility. When, planning, when should planning for re-entry begin and who should be involved in the aftercare planning? Re-entry should be done before the person is released. From the moment they're placed into a detention center or correctional facility, Planning should begin for re-entry. That is very important. Um, oftentimes, the practice is done right when they're about to be released. It needs to happen before that. 
because oftentimes juveniles and adults face issues once they are released because of the amount of time that you're away from the outside. Um, and who should be involved? Everyone. So social workers, child services, parents should be involved, the community should be involved. Because juveniles are being returned to the community, there should be some involvement on what the child will be doing once they're returned, how the child can actually make steps to better themselves, engage in constructive behaviors when they're returned. There needs to be a community effort to actually help that juvenile once they're back to make sure they don't go back. Does re-entry after short-term detention differ from re-entry after long-term? I personally believe that re-entry is re-entry. Some people believe that there's no such thing as re-entry, that you're never part of the community to begin with, mm -hmm. and this is why you went through the criminal justice system. So some people do argue that. Um, whether you've been detained or incarcerated for three months versus a month, it can have a very impactful uh, experience for juveniles, um, especially depending on what their experience was like beforehand. So your experience in a juvenile facility for three years may be equally as difficult for someone else who was only there for one year. And there are very sad stories of juveniles experiencing uh, these correctional facilities and then not being able to bounce back afterwards. What are some critical elements that should be considered in aftercare? Aftercare for juveniles specifically. Um, being able to adjust going back in, one aspect is schooling. So once again, by spending some time away from school, it may be hard to adjust to the school expectations once they're returned. Um, this can present a very difficult time adjusted and something that can actually help you in the long run, going back into school and managing that. Um, sometimes juveniles are not in school before they are detained, but this can be something that's positive, something mm. that can remain them away from the street or something that Motivation. can, exactly, something that can motivate them if they're doing well. Um, but this needs to be something that's pushed upon juveniles that they can do well, and here we're going to help you do well in school. Um, another factor is a family environment. Um, some juveniles may be in a positive family environment and others may not be. So this is also something to look into and what can we do as community members? What can we do as a nonprofit organization to help juveniles who may not be in that positive home environment? How can we support this child so they can create a social environment that's positive for themselves? Um, the community aspects. So sometimes that child may be involved with negative peers so they may just be involved with something because a friend did it. Well, actually speaking with them and say, well, you don't need to involve yourself in these type of activities. Here's some other things you can do. You like basketball? Okay, so let's get you part of this group. Let's get you part of something else that's going to help you in the long run. You're interested in painting? Instead of doing graffiti, let's get you in this program that's free that you can go and you can show your work to the community in a positive way. So there's always a positive way to address some of the problems that juveniles are faced with. What are some resources to help with aftercare? Resources. that I am very much an advocate of community-based resources. Um, so once again, getting social workers involved. Um, once again, speaking with teachers and advocates at charter schools, at local public schools, um, local PALs to help juveniles who um, are interested in some of these local programs that can actually assist them in a positive way. Thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing the wealth of knowledge that you have on this topic. Thank you. Thank you. I truly hope that this will serve as a deterrent and as a resource for those who are grappling with the juvenile justice system. We'll be right back with our Nightcap Spotlight.
you. <laughs> You've been off, and you were looking crazy during the interview. Now yes, you're off beat. Yes, What's going on? Yes, truth is, after after I saw that video, I couldn't get it together. I'm sorry. I know that was a difficult video to watch. Very. It was a difficult topic to cover altogether. For those for those of you who are just now tuning in, we brought in a criminal justice professional to discuss the juvenile justice system and the effect it has on the youth and their families. Given our topic, we are closing the show with the poignant prose of spoken word artist Penda Smith. Yes, our nightcap spotlight is on high school seniors Penda Smith, who was on the team that represented New York City at the International Brave New York Voices Festival last year. Penda's words have resonated in several venues, including the New York Poets Cafe, Apollo Theater, New York University, and Columbia University. All I can say is, I've seen this young lady perform, and afterwards, people are speechless. Great. Forget that I am fragile right now. Get it. <laughs> You'll be okay. Tell the viewers bye. Sad bye. Up next is Penda. Arthritis makes a comfortable home within the crevices of my mother's bones. Cheeks. Stay on fleek, though, skin. Stay on fleek, though. What are wrinkles to black bodies? They act how. I say, black don't crack. Our combs do. Old white guys seek to refute my contention. These scientists carry experiments in the palms of their hands. They, they mock the cross, focus on graph. The scattered plots on an X and Y coordinate plane, focus gun, focus catalyst on black point. Point to graph, shoot. Bullet erupts from the magma chambers of volcano. Spews itself on black skin, the skin don't crack. It opens, folds within itself, does not fight against foreign invader. Immune system sees black thing coming from another black thing entering a black body. Cannot tell the difference between you and bullet. Both look the same. Redo your experiment. This is just trial and error, trial and error. Observation. This is not the first time something has entered a black body without permission. This is not the first time something has demanded space without permission. This is not the first time something has colonized a land without permission. You called yourself cracker. Snapped wrist to crack whip on back of black, but black skin don't crack. It blisters and swells like swollen feet. Men and women dance the dance of melanin. They waltz across mahogany dance floors with the Grim Reaper. Wrinkles have no place on their skin. Scientists and their daughters want to look young, too. They want to wear some of our hereditary genes, but ain't got enough ass to fit into it, not enough stomach to stomach tainted water. You ask Jesus, a black man, to take his black hands and turn the water into wine. Do not cringe at the aftertaste of blood. The hands remember because the skin ain't ever gonna crack. Not when then felt the bite of a whip, the bullet of a volcano. Black skin laugh and stretch and bleed and bleed some more and screams. What is a crack? A wrinkle to skin that is just another variable burning in a scientific experiment. Just Another lab rat in a Tuskegee experiment. This is not the first time something has entered a black body without permission. Dear scientists, we could show you how black skin refuses to crack if you let us die of old age first. <laughs> 